Okay, so, hi everyone, if you don't know me, my name is Rachel and welcome back to a new video. I have seen a name cropping up everywhere in my comments section recently and that is Focus on the Family. I have been told to check out their podcast, their videos, their website, all of it. So of course, I did. <laughs> I mostly started with their website and honestly there was so much content on there I am probably going to turn this into a whole series because oh I have so much I want to talk about. I started with their about section on which they claim that they are a global Christian ministry dedicated to helping families thrive. Which sounds great on the surface, you know? Who doesn't love thriving? Who doesn't want happy families? But <laughs> I was also skeptical because this is the same stuff I've heard from countless Christian influencers before, you know, before they start spouting homophobic and transphobic and misogynistic nonsense. And the next line made me realize that this is almost definitely exactly what they're going to do. They say, we support families as they seek to teach their children about God and his beautiful design for the family, protect themselves from the harmful influence of influences of culture and equip themselves to make a greater difference in the lives of those around them. The website itself contains sections such as marriage, parenting, faith, pro-life, culture, mental health and sexuality. So of course I was spoilt for choice as to where to start and like I say, we're making a series. <laughs> But I had to choose somewhere and one of the first things I found on this website was a guide for parents called How to Talk to Your Children About Homosexuality. Now, I thought the answer to this was simply going to be Hey kids, some people are gay, some aren't. Good? That's it, right? That's all you need. What more is there? But apparently not. Apparently there are 16 pages worth of content on this topic for whatever reason. Now. I know a lot of conservatives and Christian fundies are always concerned with how gay people are indoctrinating our kids and nursery's too young to see a kid with two mummies and all that rubbish. So you'd think they themselves would stay away from kids that young too because they don't like indoctrination. They wouldn't indoctrinate kids that young, would they? Come on, we know the answer. Of course they do. But no, apparently it's only indoctrination when you're teaching kids things focus on the family don't like. So of course they open this document with a guide for how to talk to preschoolers aged two to five. So, you know, really get to them early before they've developed any critical thinking skills of their own. And they literally admit that this is what they're doing. Uh, they, they're priming kids to see things from their perspective only. They say, when children take in and process new information, they start from what they already know, connecting new information to their previous knowledge. So before your children are even aware of homosexuality, begin by giving them a biblical view of the world. It's difficult because you could say that by this standard, anything you teach a young kid is indoctrination. But I think there's a huge difference between teaching kids things like, it's important to be nice to people, or here's how to critically analyze the world around you. And yeah, these people exist and what these guys are doing, which is in our worldview, we're all sinners and these people are the most dirty sinners ever and they're going to hell. Pray for them or you're going to hell too. They tell us that with kids as young as two years old, we need to teach them that Adam and Eve's disobedience had bad consequences as sin and death entered the world. And of course, God had a plan to bring salvation to the world despite our disobedience, promising to Eve that a savior would come. Just as marriage unites a bride and her husband, Christians will one day be reunited with Jesus Christ. Those who follow Jesus will be with him forever in a new heaven and earth. Point out examples from life to teach these truths. Explain, for example, that mum and dad are married. Marriage is a good gift from God. Trust me, if someone had said to me as a kid, look at your mum and dad, that's a gift from God, I'd have said, do you have a gift receipt? Because I'd like to return it, please. When a child sees something bad, remind them that sin brought pain into the world, aka teach your child that when something bad happens to them, it's their own fault for being a dirty, disgusting sinner. We all deserve bad things that happen to us. We bring it on ourselves. When your child starts noticing that boys and girls are different, teach about God separating humanity into male and female. Life is full of such teachable moments. Or you could just give them a basic biology lesson instead. And then they offer a real life scenario. Your family is traveling and visits a new city. It's June when schools break for summer vacation. As you enjoy the sights, you begin to notice rainbow flags, t-shirts and displays, and your family sees same-sex couples holding hands. Oh, oh, excuse me while I puke. Oh, not the holding hands. <sighs> You've stumbled into a gay pride celebration. 
then, and this is shocking, this is shocking, your young child suddenly asks, why are those two men holding hands? Why are those two women kissing? <laughs> now, my answer would, of course, be because they love each other. Or maybe if I was in a more cynical mood. Yeah, they like each other. Probably. Simple. Done. Doesn't need to be more complicated, does it? People kiss or hold hands in public because they like each other. Doesn't do any harm. What's the big deal? But apparently it is a big deal because you need to teach your child to judge and hate from as young an age as possible, apparently. Here are some suggested and disgusting answers you can give your kids. God planned marriage to be between a husband and wife, but sin came into the world and causes us all to do wrong things. One wrong thing some grown-ups do is change God's plan for marriage so that two men or two women can marry. Not everyone follows God's plan for marriage, so sometimes two women will act like they're married, but they can't really be husband and wife because they're both women. Sin has confused them. They need God's help to follow him. I know. Uh, the document goes on to say, uh, this, this is ridiculous, right? Boys may be confused if you say, those men are gay, that's when two guys love each other. At this age, boys are typically relating to and identifying with other boys. So a boy might think to himself, I'm a boy and I like boys, does this mean I'm gay? Some children have come home from school lessons on homosexuality and asked this very question. <laughs> oh my god, even if they do, why is that a bad thing? Oh my god. Apparently it's bad to say gay is when two guys love each other, but it's not a bad thing to tell a kid men and women were designed to get married. It's basically saying like, you know, what, what they're telling you to teach these kids is to say, you have to be attracted to the opposite gender. Like, surely that leads the kid thinking, well, when I grow up, I need to be married to a person of the opposite gender, so I must be straight. What if you tell your kids, God wants men to like women, and the kid thinks, I'm a boy who likes girls, does that make me straight? Why is that supposedly okay, but them asking the same thing about being gay isn't? We live in this world where, like, straight is presumed to be the default, and everyone expects gay and bisexual people to have some big coming out moment, but no one ever expects straight people to come out as straight. Like, can you imagine? Millions of boys all around the world sitting down with their parents and saying, Mum, Dad, look, please don't cry, but I've been thinking about this a lot and I think I like women. Why is it okay to tell kids they have to grow up to marry the opposite gender, but it's not okay for a kid to question, well, I like boys, does that mean I'm gay? Just because they don't yet understand the difference between friendship, romantic, and sexual attraction because they're too young. It is ridiculous. For all the kids aged 6 to 12, folks on the family recommend, if the issue of homosexuality comes up, you can then explain that it is one distortion of God's design for human love. Two men who marry are missing something, the femininity of a woman. A child raised by two women is deprived of a father. Two mums can't be a dad. Wow. I think the only one missing something here is the person who's writing this as heart and compassion and common sense. Sadly, our hypersexualized culture is ready to steal innocence from children, and the rapid rise in the visibility of homosexuality makes it all too easy for some to cast a shadow on the goodness and necessity of same-sex friendships. Are you actually serious? Are they really saying that gay people existing are ruining friendships? How is this not a joke? How is this not satirical? I have no words. Oh, and don't forget, gay people are a threat to masculinity because it's gross to like boys or something, they say. As with younger children, we suggest being careful how you explain things. Saying, being gay is when two guys like each other, is confusing to boys who are strengthening their internal sense of masculinity. So like, be totally careful and don't say you like boys because you will be a real man, yeah? Oh my god. Moving on to talking to teenagers 13 and up, folks on the family recommend that you start talking to them about the biology of why gaze is bad, apparently. Our bodies have purposes too, and when a husband and wife unite sexually, they form a complete reproductive system. Their union has the capacity to bring forth new life. Homosexual unions lack this significant capability. You know who else is lacking this capability? 
couples where one or both partners are infertile, or the woman's gone through menopause, or the man has aged to a point where he no longer has mobile enough sperm or whatever. Are they all sinners who should be shamed too? And that's before we even mention those of us who never want kids at all. I just think teaching kids that their only purpose in life is to get married and have babies is limiting and gross. They go on to complain that we should warn teens that, on the flip side, the secular worldview says, there is no God, and the only real meaning I have in life is what I choose. In this worldview, there is no larger purpose, and nothing is sacred. Not sexuality, marriage, family, or children. So marriage can be redefined to be something that it's never been before. Two men or two women. Likewise, sexual relationships have few or no limits. In this non-biblical, human-centered view, sexual activity is separated from marriage and procreation, and even from being a male-female union. It becomes more about seeking pleasure or self-fulfillment. Is, is that supposed to scare us? Oh, no, don't do this thing. It'll only ever bring, bring you pleasure and fulfillment. Definitely don't do it. No, bad. And that's the end of that document. I honestly should have known these guys were awful from the minute I saw them recommending Jackie Hill Perry's book, Gay Girl, Good God, about a woman who stopped being gay when she found God. Seriously, if you're interested in a review of that, I have a three-part review on my channel. It is a lot. Enjoy. <laughs> the next part of this video, I wanna briefly focus on another of their documents, this time titled, When a Loved One Says, I'm Gay. This one opens with a warning that we live in a time where sexual fluidity and the celebration of homosexuality are commonplace. One outcome of this is that more people now identify as lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transgender, with greater numbers in younger age groups. But I'd argue that no, we don't actually have more people who identify as gay, bi, or trans, or anything. I reckon the numbers are pretty much the same they've always been. The difference is that more people than ever feel confident, safe, and comfortable being open about their identity, and that can only be a good thing. We haven't got more gay people than ever, we just have more openly gay people who are comfortable and confident in expressing who they are, and that is a great thing. One part which gave me a real belly laugh, actually, the first time I read it was, homosexuality has a strong cultural component. If people were born gay, we would not see such a large increase in such a short time span in identification as homosexual or bisexual. Like, are you actually serious? You literally acknowledge that, and I quote, uh, we've just seen almost 50 years of gay pride activism and more frequently the celebration of homosexuality in our entertainment and media along with growing numbers of LGBT identified celebrities. These things aren't turning people gay, they're making the world a safer place for gay and trans people to express themselves and be open about who they are and be true to themselves. Not as many people have to hide away anymore and that's a good thing, that's all. It's not the media turning people gay, it's the media helping normalize these identities, showing that, you know, they're absolutely fine and normal and wonderful, giving people the confidence to be who they are and express who they are. That's all. So they're going to say that if your child comes to you and tells you that they're gay, you should respond with compassion and kindness and say things like, I love you as you are, I will always love you, this does not change my love for you, thank you for sharing this with me, or I want to know you and relate to you, so I'm glad you told me about this area of your life. And oh my god, this is great, wonderful, excellent advice. I was like, this is actually really good stuff. Definitely say these things to your kid. Brilliant. And then they go and ruin it. In addition to the above points, we strongly encourage you not to label your children as gay, lesbian, bisexual, or even homosexual. Words are powerful and have an impact. Labeling someone pushes them towards that identity. Instead, we suggest being intentional about differentiating between the many components of human sexuality, including thoughts, romantic and sexual feelings, behaviors, and identity. And then they tell you to do all you can to hope your child turns away from a life of homosexuality. They say, pray that your loved one will become aware of the consequences of sin so he or she can be led to a change of heart. Seriously. And if you, as a parent or person who knows a gay person is struggling with this, you can always go and find a counselor for yourself or the gay person. They say, find professional or pastoral support and counseling. Please be cautious with this, as there are wolves in sheep's clothing. Many therapists and some clergy and churches and denominations too have revised their views of God, scripture and sexuality and now approve of homosexual relationships. 
ask the therapist or pastor what they believe about the Bible, sexuality and homosexuality. If you were buying a car, you would ask lots of questions and do your research. Think about how much more important this is. You're putting your soul into another person's care. Be prepared with a list of questions and beware of gay affirming therapists. Oh my god, it's like a bad fairy tale, isn't it? Beware of gay affirming therapists. Like you you cannot make this stuff up. It is laughable if it wasn't so terrifying. Then there's a section titled Navigating Grief and Loss, which I thought would be about things like how to cope when your child inevitably leaves your life because you didn't accept them and try to change them, or for like people whose kids killed themselves because, you know, you didn't accept them and try to change them, because sadly those things happen a lot. But that's not what this is about. Instead, well, just let me read it to you. For Christian parents, learning a son or daughter is struggling with homosexuality can be extremely painful and confusing. Christians who know God's intent for sexuality, relationships and marriage understand that homosexual behaviour falls outside that design and is a grievous sin. We want the best for our children and we believe identifying as gay and becoming involved in same-sex relationships is harmful and damaging. In addition, here are some other reasons parents may struggle deeply with their child's disclosure. Homosexuality, being gay, often becomes the person's primary identity. Those who embrace a gay identity may abandon biblical beliefs and values they once held. Seriously. But don't worry, they end on a positive note. Be encouraged! There are many who once embraced a homosexual identity only to find it didn't satisfy the deepest longings of their heart. Many return to the Christian faith. I know, right? Our last article that we're looking at today is horrific. It is so, so bad. I, I barely even knew where to start with this one. There's just, it's a short article and there is so much wrong with it. It is titled, Do Gender Identity Laws Affect Me and My Family? It opens with, be aware that for a variety of reasons, almost everyone in the US is affected by the shift in thinking about gender and gender identity. This shift has influenced city and state laws, corporate policies, and federal agencies. These laws and policies affect almost all of us because, and then it goes on to list a bunch of changes in laws and policies that I fail to see are a bad thing at all. For example, gender identity laws and policies affect everyone, from cities and states to businesses like Target, Macy's, or Planet Hollywood, to federal agencies. Those with any gender identity may use any public accommodations, threatening privacy and safety of others. Does anyone else get the impression that they don't know what gender identity means? They use it as like a dirty word, but do they realise that we all have a gender identity? Every single one of us. Not just trans people and non-binary people, all of us have a gender identity. <laughs> At least 17 states in the District of Columbia have non-discrimination laws for public accommodations, such as restrooms, locker rooms and changing rooms, that include, that include gender identity or gender expression. If you live in these states, or if you travel, you could encounter someone with a different gender identity in a public facility. Yeah, I often encounter people with different identities to me in my everyday life in public spaces. I have cis men who live across the hall from me. I went to a restaurant this weekend that had uh, unisex toilet cubicles, and I queued in the hallway with cis men, non-binary people, trans men and women, and you know what? It was fine <laughs> existing in a space next to people of different ident of different gender identities to me was literally no different from any other day of my life. It's really not a big deal. Or the other day I was in Huddersfield train station and I went to use the loos and I walked in and oh my god, shock horror, there was a cis man cleaning the sink. <gasps> you know what I did? I said, hi, walked past him and went to use the cubicle. That was the whole interaction. There was someone of a different gender identity in the bathroom. Didn't affect me at all. He was there doing his job. I think what this author is really trying to say though is that if you're a cis woman, you might encounter a trans woman in the bathroom and oh my god, what a, what a shock. Or a cis man might encounter a trans man in the bathroom. <gasps> oh, like it, It's really not a big deal, is it? I don't get what's so shocking about that. I don't get what the uproar is. I, they get so hung up on these like, oh my god, such big differences in gender identity and blah, 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 and like it's all a bad thing. And they want people to use bathrooms um, based on 
sex characteristics and stuff. So they would want trans men to use the women's bathrooms because chances are they were born with a vagina, right? But they go on about such big differences in gender identity. Blah, 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 blah. But let's be honest, I as a cis woman have far more in common and are far more similar to a trans woman than I am to a trans man. So if you want to go on about like differences in gender identity, why do you want trans men in the women's bathrooms? They don't think this through. When they want trans women to use the men's bathrooms and trans men to use the women's bathrooms, they don't realise that one, this can be incredibly incom uncomfortable for those people, it can be incredibly unfair to them, it can be like incredibly dysphoric for a lot of them, it can cause a lot of anxiety and stress, and two, it can put them in so much more danger than just allowing them to use the bathroom they identify as. I'm pretty sure a trans woman is more likely to be assaulted in a men's bathroom than they are to be like in any danger in a women's bathroom. It's not fair to those individuals to force them into the wrong bathrooms. But they don't think about these things because this isn't actually about, ooh, let's make sure people use the right bathrooms. They don't think about the trans men who have to go into the women's bathrooms. They don't think about the trans women who they force into the men's bathrooms. They don't think about those things because they just want to erase trans people in general and it's not okay. And what's scary is that you know so many of these people who make these arguments would probably get violent and aggressive against trans people using the right bathrooms for themselves. But let's say, for example, they put in a policy saying you have to use bathroom based on like what gender you were assigned at birth or like what certain like sexual characteristics you have, right? So let's say they make anyone with a vagina go into the women's bathrooms and they enforce this and then you have a trans man who is completely passing has been on hormones for years for god knows like maybe has a beard or whatever and they have to go into the women's bathroom like you know conservatives are going to get angry about that as well you know fundies are going to get angry about that as well it's just ugh. the whole thing is just such a mess trans people are already at risk of so so much violence against them why make it any worse? Why make it more difficult? It just, it's ridiculous. And there are so many different facets to this topic and so much I could talk about and I don't think I have time to cover it all. So if I've not covered a point that you want to bring up, please leave it down in the comments. I'm sure there's like other situations as well that I haven't thought of. It's just, let people pee where they want to. It's just peeing, you know? They say that another policy example is that at a federal level, agencies such as the US Departments of Education and Justice have redefined laws that mandate no discrimination on the basis of sex to include sexual orientation and gender identity. For example, Title IX was passed in 1973 to help level the playing field for girls in education. It mandated no discrimination on the basis of sex, which meant schools had to start providing equal funding for girls' sports and facilities. But a recent guidance letter sent out by these departments to all public schools schools and colleagues say that sex in Title IX now includes transgender identified students. According to these two federal agencies, boys who believe they are girls must be able to compete on girls teams and use girls facilities and vice versa. Oh no, kids can play sports with other kids and not face discrimination. How awful. Um, the article then goes on to say, yes, gender identity laws place everyone at risk. The bottom line? You are affected, or your children, grandchildren, or other family members are, because of city and county ordinances, state laws, business practices, and administrating edicts from the federal government. Transgender identify- I hate that term, transgender identify- Transgender identified and gender dysphoric individuals are not necessarily more dangerous than anyone else. How- how good of you to say. However, these laws and policies allow dangerous individuals open admission to public accommodations. No. They don't. If dangerous people are going to go places they shouldn't to do harm, they're going to do it anyway, regardless of the rights given to good law-abiding citizens. Some un individuals who fall under the transgender umbrella are sexually aroused by cross-dressing. So a heterosexual man who is a cross-dresser or transgender fetishist may be sexually aroused by dressing as a woman. However, he will still be attracted to women. This is exactly the type of person women do not want in the restroom or locker room with them, but who are now legally allowed to be there dressed as a woman or not. <sighs> Where do we even start with how messed up this is? <sighs> For God's sake, like, okay, one, cross-dressing and transgender, very different things. Two, if someone's doing something for sexual gratification in public, 
that is a problem in its own right. That likely makes them a sex offender or whatever and has nothing to do with their gender identity. A person being sexually aroused in public has nothing to do with whether they're transgender or not. That's a problem in its own right. It's such a bizarre way of putting things. Transgender people aren't affirming their gender for self-sexual arousal any more than a cis woman is wearing a cardigan for self-sexual arousal, you know? That said, look at these descriptions again. A heterosexual man who is a cross-dresser or transgender fetishist may be sexually aroused by dressing as a woman, however he will still be attracted to women. There is so much wrong with that. Take the offensive cross-dressing part out and they're literally just saying you shouldn't be allowed to be in a room with someone who's attracted to your gender or you shouldn't be allowed to be in a room with someone whose gender you're attracted to. Like, you do realise that even among cis people, gay and bisexual people exist and manage to not sexually harass or assault anyone in public or private spaces. I've been in bathrooms with several lesbians and never once been assaulted. <laughs> And you realise that in other public and private spaces, including unisex bathrooms and other spaces like that, there are plenty of straight men who manage to not assault women all the time, right? This idea that anyone who has a gender, gender identity or sexuality you don't understand is going to jump straight to assault is just bizarre and dangerous and damaging and insulting. It is bad. It's really, really bad. And again, this just reminds me of like those old pro-segregation arguments about why people of different races should have different bathrooms of water fountains and entrances and so on. It is gross, really gross. And that's not even everything wrong with this statement. But again, please feel free to rip it apart down in the comments because it's so messed up on so many levels. And obviously I can't cover everything, but it's, oh God, it's bad, right? They say, there are also a growing number of stories of individuals who have committed crimes against women and children, some of whom serve time in prison and who are now transitioning to become the opposite sex, which may give them more access to women and children. Sometimes the penal system even pays with our tax dollars for an inmate's transition. I'm going to say one, this sounds like a huge urban legend that's just fear mongering. But once again, even if this is true, even if you can show me examples of this, the problem isn't that they're transgender. The problem is that they're abusers and sex offenders. Their gender identity has nothing to do with that. And if you're going to make this argument, then are you also going to petition to ban cis women who are sex offenders from women's only bathrooms as well? What about men who are sex offenders from entering men's bathrooms? Are you going to ban that as well? Because I really think you should if you want to protect these people, right? They end with, to reiterate, we're not seeing gender confused individuals, I know, right, are more likely to be dangerous. However, there are people who will now take advantage of gender identity laws and policies to gain access to women and children. No one who is concerned about opening up bathrooms and showers to the opposite sex is questioning the inherent worth and value of all people, including those who struggle with gender confusion. So bad, right? So bad. But seriously, they're like, oh no, we're like, we're not invalidating them. We just want to make millions of trans people suffer because a few criminals are pretending to be them. That's what they're saying. It's, okay, this might seem like a weird comparison, but I've spoken about this before in other videos, but to me, I view this in the same way I've spoken about things like benefits in the past, right? There was a big push in the early 2000s, especially in the UK, uh, with like fear mongering around people claiming benefits. Uh, there were programs and news articles and stories about people who were committing benefit fraud and playing the system and all sorts of stuff like that and it did demonize all people who claimed benefits. It made them all look bad. But the solution to that was not to scrap the benefit system altogether. Because one, the people committing the fraud were the minority, and two, scrapping the entire system would have caused an unbelievable amount of harm to millions of families. And it's not fair that the families who genuinely needed the benefits and were claiming them properly and legally and doing everything right, it's not fair that they would have to suffer for the few people who were committing fraud. And let's be honest, the people who were committing fraud, if they weren't doing it that way, they'd have found another way to do it and to steal, defraud people, do whatever they wanted because they were doing it for immoral reasons, not because the benefit system was there, you know? Sure, the people committing benefit fraud were bad, but they were the minority and the majority who were innocent and needed benefits shouldn't have been punished for the minority abusing the system. The system still needed to be there. The solution isn't simple, it's not easy. It involves weeding out those committing fraud 
punishing them and so on. But you also need to keep allowing the families who need benefits to keep claiming them undisturbed. It's not fair to punish them for a minority who are breaking laws. And it's the same with this whole bathroom thing. Even if you can say, oh look, here's a handful of criminals who are abusing this law to do something bad, it's not fair to punish the millions of other people who aren't doing that, who literally just want to use a bathroom and pee or fix their hair or wash their hands or do whatever they need to, you know? Sure, crack down on those abusing the system, track down sex offenders, monitor them more, do whatever you need to, punish them for their crimes, but don't punish those who are just using the system correctly. Trans men who just want to go pee in the men's bathroom, trans women who just want to go pee in the women's bathroom, they're not doing anything wrong and it's not fair that they have their freedoms, they have the system that protects them in place, it's not fair to have that taken away when they've done literally nothing wrong. <sighs> in conclusion, screw Jeff Johnson who wrote this article. <laughs> Okay, hopefully I've covered everything in there. Well, I haven't. I haven't even come close to co covering everything in there. It's a messed up article. There's so much misinformation and fear mongering and bad stuff um, in all of this. But thank you for watching today. This was my first look at Focus on the Family. There's still so, so much more I could cover. If there are any specific articles or sections of the website you want me to cover first, please let me know down in the comments and I'll try and do that. Let me know your thoughts on everything in this video so far. If you enjoyed this video today, please subscribe, that would be great if you're new here. Um, otherwise, just check you're still subscribed if you've been around for a while, because YouTube have been unsubscribing people. If you're interested, I have brand new merch available now, including these amazing, really cool beetle t-shirts uh, featuring some of my own paintings. This is the all over print blue beetle one. I've also got a green beetle one with an all over print like this as well. These t-shirts are so soft, so comfy. I have been wearing this non-stop. Don't judge me, I actually pulled this out of the washing basket to show it on camera right now because I haven't stopped wearing it. <laughs> Um, there's also uh, just one big beetle print t-shirts as well available in a variety of colours and if that's not your thing I have other designs available, um, other all over painting t-shirts with some really cool abstract patterns like this, this bright funky one which also comes in leggings as well which again I have the leggings, they are my favourite things to wear while I'm editing because they're so comfy and soft and cosy, I love them. I have these cute little Kyra fairy t-shirts, I have the bad poetry t-shirts if you want something a little bit more subtle, I have these really cool like fearless t-shirts uh, which all feature like hand-drawn handwriting from me. Basically everything's designed by me, a lot of it's all done by hand, it's really cool, really unique, I love it and I'd appreciate you checking out my merch store if you fancy it. But for now I think that's pretty much me done, I've been talking a while. Thank you for watching today, I appreciate you a lot and I'll see you all again very very soon. Goodbye!